I think we can we can start already. Um, welcome to welcome all to the fourth more TMT workshop on behalf of, of Polis Network. We would like to welcome to uh, the fourth workshop of a series of, of workshops uh, meant to discuss uh, a series of uh, TMT related topics. And for today, uh, I would like to welcome our panelists, uh, Peter, uh, Rasmus, Lucian, uh, Alexander. Um, Magnus and Raymond um, that will be joining us in the in two pan in discussion panels, and uh, of course Isabel from uh, the European Commission will who will be joining uh, for the second uh, panel. So for the first panel uh, we will have a um, uh, um, or, or the sorry for the um, program for today we will have an introduction to the more project by Professor Peter Jones. Following uh, uh, the introduction, we'll have the first panel, discussion panel, in which uh, we will uh, discuss uh, uh, about their interurban, um, about um, our name panel, more mobility, less traffic in, in urban and interurban areas, where we'll have a discussion between the city, the city's representatives from um, um, Malmo, um, Hamburg, and uh, Copenhagen. And uh, following uh, this discussion panel, we will have the second uh, discussion panel uh, on uh, the implications of the decarbonization agenda for the TNT and urban nodes policies, where we'll have uh, the representative from the European Commission, Isabel Mas, uh, um, Alexander Bichiski from the European Cyclist Federation, and Lucian Sagan from Eurocities. So um, in between uh, the two panels, we'll have a small interact interactive session in which we'll ask you a question and uh, uh, we will uh, be um, um, posting uh, yeah, the results of these, these questions. Finally, we will end up with a discussion um, with a, we'll end up with a um, 50 minutes to uh, pick up these uh, uh, questions from the audience and uh, 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 end the, the workshop. So um, now I, will, I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Peter Jones, who will uh, talk about um, the more project. So, uh, Peter, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Oops, that's not what's supposed to happen. Sorry about that. Uh, that is not what's supposed to happen. Uh, I'll stop sharing for a minute. Sorry. Ah, um, well, there we are. You're getting a yeah, you're getting a, a quick post view. Uh, of my slides. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. I'll just give you a welcome to our 10 related session this afternoon. I'll just give you um, a very brief overview um, of the issues we're covering in MORE. So MORE stands for Multimodal Optimization for Road Space in Europe, um, and it's a very ambitious project where we set out to identify existing and future pressures on main roads in cities that connect urban areas and their major attractors with the national 10 network, trans-European network. So the connectors from the uh, outside the city into the key attractors in the city, the city centre, the port, et cetera, we're calling those feeder routes. And we're developing design tools and processes that will enable these key routes to be better planned, designed, managed and operated in a way that make them responsive to future pressures in a more holistic and flexible manner. And we're doing that by exploiting possibilities for more dynamic space management and operation, and also taking account of the interfaces between urban and interurban or national 10T networks, which is the focus of our, our session this afternoon. We're also very much aware of future challenges. In many cities, increasing population employment, cities becoming more 24 hour, in some cases, aging, um, generally growing wealth, therefore potentially growing mobility, and related to COVID, but more generally, more home deliveries, more services, more vans and things like that. Also new technological challenges, new forms of mobility, um, products, sorry, products and services, in scooters, various things, the growing influence of non-transport technologies such as remote health treatment or 3D printing, surface and subsurface development uh, in terms of how we maintain the road network or, or dig it up for fiber, optics, whatever, and digitalization and cyber security threats and the whole issue about interagency cooperation. 
This gives a very brief overview of what we've been doing in MORE, which will be finishing February next year. Our first phase was around investigation and review. We looked at the users of the streets, the policies, the regulations, organizational structures, and also uh, trends and future scenarios. Then in the second section, we developed a series of design tools to help cities in better um, plan, design, and operate, manage the feeder routes in, these, in a series of case study applications. And now we're in the process of developing more toolkit um, and refining the tools that we've developed for a subsequent exploration, exploration exploitation as well. These are our five cities uh, in the MORE project. As you can see, London, Lisbon, Melma, Budapest, Constanza, uh, and they sit, each sit on a different uh, 10T corridor. In fact, um, some sit on one, more than one 10T corridor. In terms of basic concepts that we're dealing with, we recognize as the feeder routes come in off the Tenty network into the city, they start off being what we call roads, only designed for motorized traffic, as in the top picture there, where uh, most of the traffic will be cars and, and very few buses or motorcycles and certainly no um, pedocycles and things like that. As they come in towards the center of cities, they morph into what we call streets, um, where you have pedestrian cyclists, um, people crossing the road, and, and uh, activities and frontages adjacent to the, the street, shops, offices, ho houses, and things like that. So the 10T network obviously primarily has the upper characteristic. And as we get into the city on the feeder routes, it changes into the lower type of characteristic. And in the case of streets, we're dealing with much more than just the, the carriageway. Um, and you can see here, we're suggesting that um, you have a basic carriageway and footway, which is common for roads and streets, but as they morph into streets, they also consider cycle and pedestrians. We also have builders on either sides that interact with the streets, requirements for parking or just generating attractiveness of those streets. And under the carriageways and footways, we have utilities, possibly underground, that interacts at various times with the surface or takes pressure off the surface network and then airspace. And obviously the potential growing use of, um, of drones and, and small light electric planes for moving electric taxis for moving people around. In a previous project, Create, we looked back 50 or 60 years at um, how cities uh, have changed in terms of their policy priorities. But we could generally see that um, uh, middle of the half, in the middle of the last century, cities were very much trying to grapple with the growth in car ownership and car use. So cities were focused around the car. Then for a number of reasons to do with sustainability, but also efficiency and the impact of the of building enough roads everybody to drive, the focus switched to improving public transport cycle networks and providing things like bus and cycle lanes. And then over the last 10 or 20 years, layered on top of that has been a focus on cities as places uh, where people come together, share activities, with an emphasis on encouraging street activity, improving public realm, and actually actively restraining traffic within our cities. And here's an example of what that means in terms of the road space. So this is just by the City of London. Um, you can see in the top picture in the 1960s, uh, when there was an emphasis on trying to provide more road space for growing car traffic, the church there uh, was ended up in the middle of a rather large roundabout, somewhat isolated. Um, then uh, three years ago, that, most of that road was taken out and replaced by a large public square with limited road capacity around the edge and more reliance on a nearby. Uh, underground station. So same amount of road space, but a very different policy priority, and that led to a very different use of space. What we also found was that these policies tend to be different in different parts of the city. So the, the city of places has been very much done in many city centres in Europe, um, increasingly into the inner suburbs, the greater focus on sustainable mobility, uh, cycle networks, bus networks, and so on in the inner to middle city, and the outer city and beyond the outer city still very much being more focused on motorized movement, which of course is where the 10T networks tend to operate. So what does that leave us in terms of, of challenges in relation to the 10T network? Well, uh, the first one is the, the question of, of, of boundaries and uh, changing um, responsibility. So here is uh, one of the roads out of central London, our feeder route in the case of London, uh, London's inner London on the top uh, left hand side, the M25 edge of London on the bottom right hand side, and you can see the boundary between the TfL road responsibility and Highways England 
uh, road responsibility is rather arbitrary at that boundary, not actually next to the motorway or anything, um, but in the middle of, uh, from the motorist point of view, uh, a continuous stretch of road. The other challenge is, this is taken from Greater Manchester. Um, you can see the, uh, the sort of ready brown color there. This is, um, all these go back from 1996 as an index of 100, and they show the change in, in uh, motor vehicle trip kilometers by road type. Um, and you can see that um, the, the red orange one there, which is the motorways around Greater Manchester, you can see over that period um, of 20 years, road traffic's increased by 40%. On the other hand, if you take the blue one, uh, sorry, the green one, the roads in the city center, it's gone down by 40%. And generally this epitomizes what's happening in many cities that within the, uh, within the city, in particular the inner city, traffic is decreasing. And in fact, there is a policy in many cities to decrease traffic, whereas on the motorway and 10T networks, there's still an expectation of traffic growth. And in many cases, that's what's being planned for. And of course, a, a decrease in traffic once you get the built up area at the same time as catering for traffic growth outside the area obviously creates this tension. So um, what we found is in, within the Moore City, a general lack of coordination between the 10T network and the urban network. Um, surprise, not surprisingly, our Moore cities are focused on the roads within their administrative area. Um, as you saw, the boundaries are often unrelated to network structures. They just happen to be where they are historically. Um, we found in most of our cities there's very little day-to-day -day interaction between the city authorities and the national or 10T network operators. Um, and each authority tends to optimize its own network with, with less consideration of repercussions for others. Um, and as we saw, the policy priorities are obviously very different at urban and interurban level. At urban levels, increasingly, the emphasis is on trying to reduce car use, increase alternative modes, and improve the livability and placemaking of our roads and streets. Whereas interurban the focus is still very much seen as an economic one on moving passenger or freight vehicles as efficiently as possible. So this will re relates to our first topic that we're going to talk about um, around um, the issue of mobility and traffic in urban and interurban areas. My last slide is just related to the second discussion about decarbonisation, where this is um, our National Health Service. Uh, they've um, come up with a target of becoming carbon net neutral. Um, by 2045. And to do that, they've looked at all their different uh, sources of emission. And you can see the one circled in red, National Health Service fleet and lease vehicles, business travel, freight transport, uh, patient visitor travel, staff commuting. All those things together um, represent something like 15% of the total CO2 emissions from the health service in the UK. And the important thing as part of decarbonisation is that major organizations begin to take some responsibility for the traffic they generate. And I think we'll, we'll pick this up in the second discussion. Um, I think it's very important that the transport bodies are able to work with the major trip generation, the tracting organizations, if we really are to, to get to carbon zero in good time. So thank you very much indeed for that. I'll stop sharing. And I think we'll go straight into the, the first panel, which I say is going to be talking around the issues of um, providing for mobility, but potentially less traffic, and the tension with between possibly urban policies to reduce traffic levels and interurban uh, focus still on actually providing for increased mobility for economic efficiency. So um, we have uh, we have three speakers uh, who are going to talk on this subject. First of all, I'd like to invite Magnus Farr from the city of Melbourne. Over to you, Magnus. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... And I will uh, start with the presentation, uh, which I had about eight minutes to do. And then uh, I understood it there should be a short panel discussion after my presentation. Is that correct? Uh, well, we have three presentations. So we'll take the three presentations and have a discussion. Yeah. OK, OK. Yeah. And I understand. I share my screen now. Um, screen two. That's my. And we can see your time table. Yeah, right? and now you see my presentation. Now we can see your presentation, yeah. Yeah, you. very good. Well, um, um, this is uh, much just <laughs> repeating what you said further, uh, Peter. 
uh, my presentation. This is about how we, uh, in two cases, have tried to manage this uh, diverse uh, policies between the national level and, and the local level. Uh, and, and we see these different uh, developments uh, in, in uh, use of road space within cities and, and on the uh, national road network. Uh, the uh, diagram on the left hand, it's uh, the development of, of different uh, traffic types uh, within the city of Malmö, but also including the, the outer ring road and the inner ring road, which you can see on the map. Uh, the blue line is the development of, of uh, road traffic, uh, uh, cars and, and, and uh, HGVs. Uh, on, on different uh, measure points in within the city and on in the city's outskirts. It has uh, yeah, stood still since uh, 2007, you say. And then the other modes, uh, bicycle, trains uh, and, and buses have uh, increased uh, pretty much since then. Uh, the dotted line is the, the develop, development of inhabitants within the city. And on the other hand, you can see the, the growth in, uh, in both car traffic and freight traffic on the uh, E6, which is the, the, uh, the biggest uh, motorway around Malmö and uh, from uh, south and north. So we definitely have this uh, clash between the, the uh, increasing demand on the outskirts and um, how do we then, uh, how do we meet each other, the national level and the local level? Well, as Peter said, the national policy is to support the growth of, of the economy, economy with the, the industri industry, trade and labor markets. And uh, then the measures uh, that uh, are on the infrastructure of the national level is, is often, uh, focused on el eliminating uh, bottlenecks and increasing commuting distances, uh, enlarging uh, labor markets. Uh, on the other hand, the policy uh, within the city of Malmö is, is to uh, expand the city with more inhabitants and, and growth, but with a higher density. So we, we, we expand within our uh, uh, ring roads system, you could say. In common, we have the the uh, uh, the will and, and ambition to expand the railway network because it 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 serves both our objectives, you can say. And and since uh, many years, we have expanded our uh, uh, inner city network system with the city tunnel. And then we, we also strengthen and modernize uh, the city bus network uh, with electric Malmö Express lines. Uh, we expand our bicycle network and we reduce uh, growth of individual, individual car traffic with these uh, uh, measures and also reducing road space and uh, with our parking policy. And then in the the interface between the, the outer ring road system, the motorway system, and uh, where the, this system meets the, the local urban road network. Then we have two uh, uh, examples, the recent examples where we have uh, done some mes measures. The first one uh, I would like to mention is the Stockholm's Vägen the road to Stockholm. Uh, if you see the little map uh, of, of uh, Scania there, you can see this is, um, it shows where uh, the regional authority, which are responsible for the uh, passenger transport network uh, in the bus system and train system in Skåne, they have uh, pointed out where we have to increase capacity on regional bus lines. Uh, these lines, they uh, are practically the same routes as uh, the E6 uh, motorway, you can say, from south and north. 
uh, and uh, the incoming uh, uh, main corridors from these directions then meet the, the local uh, city level. And what we have done on uh, the north one, the Stockholm road, is that we have uh, within existing road space, we have uh, uh, constructed a bus lane. Uh, and uh, one challenge in this project was how to uh, let the bus uh, uh, flow free, so to say, but uh, with withholding the, the car traffic. Uh, so uh, this picture shows the bus goes in the middle, and then we have two, one lane on each side for uh, uh, the other road traffic, which then we have to hold back because we don't want to uh, create a, a increased congestion within the city. So this was a simple solution, no ITS whatsoever. We, we kept the traffic signaling, signaling system as it was. We just uh, put in an extra lane for the bus uh, and it flows perfectly now. Uh, but then we don't have space for uh, um, uh, car, wrecked cars or something. We have to take that away. And from uh, the other example is that we, we had a, a common uh, investigation together with the national, national level and the regional level, uh, how we could uh, in, uh, increase uh, uh, capacity from the south. And this uh, investigation resulted in, in uh, uh, the introduction of a, a high capacity regional bus line, uh, a so-called Skåne Expressen, which will go into traffic, uh, I think, next year with these double-decker uh, high capacity buses. So, uh, there, there were other measures studied there, uh, example, for example, expanding the two six lane motorway, which didn't happen. Uh, so yeah, I think I'm, I, I'm ready there. Did I, I, yep. I was some time, yeah? That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Max. Really interesting. We'll pick up that in the discussion. So thank you. If you yep. could stop sharing your screen. Yes. Um, then we could pass over to Rasmus Frisk from the city of Copenhagen. Um, Rasmus, if you'd like to share your presentation. Thank you. Let's see how I stop the sharing. So. Great. Thank you. We can see your slide. Not on full screen yet, but we can see it. It should be there now, right? Yeah, great. <clears throat> awesome. Well, it's always a nice challenge to be uh, given uh, of, of doing a presentation uh, of, uh, well, in this case, three different projects in, t in, in eight minutes and only bringing three slides. Uh, but it's a challenge I, I embrace in, in the way that often uh, we, we tend to uh, focus too much on, on the slides here. I'm giving you uh, two starting off quite far away, actually from Melbourne, uh, must say a bit out of Europe, but then uh, landing quite securely in the, in the end on this third slide in, in Malmö. And this is of course uh, meant as inspiration uh, for all these, uh, all your clever minds out there uh, about how are we able to uh, work together about some of these challenges that we're facing um, <clears throat> often uh, that we see regarding um, different organizations, representing different organizations, being different experts coming together. Um, so the first project here is a project we were called in to do in uh, Melbourne, in Spencer Street, which is one of the major roads or streets in the inner city. Um, and one of the challenges was that a lot of these different organizations, uh, traffic for uh, Victoria and uh, Vic Roads, Victorian Roads, and the city of Melbourne are often three individual uh, organizations that are running their own uh, parallel uh, project tracks uh, in, in a silo and not necessarily uh, listening in or inviting others in uh, along the way before in the very end, they, they actually reach out and, and ask uh, like city of Melbourne is asking Vic Rhodes, well, 
please could you sign on to this project we, we've done over the last six months. And uh, these are some of the challenges that we're facing, not just in Melbourne, but also globally, is that uh, when we're running these parallel projects uh, in, in silos, we're not benefiting from each other's knowledge. Um, and one of the classical things like the uh, city of Melbourne, of course, is very much into the, <clears throat> the human scale and the, the, the livability, while Vic Roads, uh, Victoria Roads is actually just put into this world for uh, getting the, the car movement or the traffic movement float as, as, as good as easily as, as possible. Uh, so in that way, those two were often bumped heads when they met in a meeting room or for workshops because they are simply had different agendas um, for, uh, for, for, for the course. Uh, but what we did was simply bring it uh, some a new element to, uh, to the room. We, uh, we brought uh, a new type of gamification uh, in a workshop setting. First off, uh, Transport for New South Wales was hiring us in to simply try to look at six, uh, like um, six terminals, uh, bus, metro, and uh, tram terminals in the city center of the city of Melbourne. Uh, that was struggling. Uh, some of these classical things were that uh, they were too too many pedestrians, too many people on the trams in the morning. They couldn't get trams enough in to the city simply because they were packed and there were really boom on the tracks uh, to actually add more trams. Um, Vic Roads was of course extremely concerned about that the, this should um, you know, be something that would, 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 something would happen with their movement with their cars, you know, if we had to start to change things. Um, but what we started off doing was just simply to visualize uh, some of the problems that were there some of the classical problems were that we actually had so many people walking in the city in the morning uh, that a lot of them were actually falling off the curb, meaning that they felt into traffic simply because there was so such a big congestion, congestion, congestion of, of people on the sidewalks. Uh, so that was, of course, an extremely dangerous uh, situation. And us starting to film it and, 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 and make a small teaser that we showed uh, all the stakeholders in the room so they could actually see some of the problems uh, that they were facing and we needed to be together that we need to co, uh, co-design co a new strategy forward that would benefit all different organs and, and everybody could live with. And that was actually the second uh, half of the project is that uh, Transport for New South Wales, sorry, Transport for Victoria then said, well, could you please help with, 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 with a project they called uh, pilot and trialing. So that meant uh, how can we test stuff out in the city um, on a temporary basis you know, could we test out to widen up the pedestrian sidewalks uh, over a two month period and figure out, are, are we getting the right amount? Or is that the width that we're looking, looking for to, to cater the amount of, of pedestrians? Uh, could we test uh, to take out cars at one streets or do one way streets or do all these kind of uh, instant urbanism uh, elements that we often see that are, are being done also in many European cities. So uh, the image that you look at here is actually uh, one of the workshops that we did with them where we actually played this game that we designed, that we developed called Archinopoly. Uh, and basically it's a bit like Monopoly, but it's without the money. Uh, but it's it's very much about how you can win together. Um, and it's actually the same, the feeling about uh, when you're playing a game, it's a bit more shoulders down that people are all uh, interested in, in, in it's a bit more energetic. Uh, and in this case here, the goal and the main goal was to create a guideline uh, that everybody could pick up afterwards about how to implement uh, a, a pilot and trial uh, thing in the city. Uh, so it was a guideline that showed how and, and, and when you should invite different stakeholders in. So they didn't have that problem in the end of, of asking uh, other org organizations to sign on to it, but they could actually co-design it as they, as they went along. Um, so another project uh, was just uh, uh, on the edge of the city of Melbourne uh, in, in a new precinct called the, or the new biomedical precinct called Haymarket, where we looked at the roundabouts and some of the boulevards. And one of the problems that they were facing here was that, that they were simply out of scale for, for humans and, and, and catering, the, 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 they, were out of, they were not able to cater the amount of, of, of traffic for, for bicyclists and, and pedestrians. Uh, now and in the future, 
And by having all these different stakeholders together brought around the same table, this was not just uh, the different traffic organs like Victoria uh, Roads, but uh, it was also the Victorian Planning Authority, it was of course, uh, transport for, for, for Victoria and of course, City of Melbourne, but it was also you know, different stakeholders around that area, University of Melbourne, uh, some of those biometrical uh, hospitals and stuff like that. And the interesting part about bringing them together in such a way by using this gamification where we were asking them to put dices on the board, you know, trying to identify issues to start off with by putting a red dice on the board and, and say it out loud and then try to turn the dices from red to yellow. That was the land of opportunity. And then furthermore, trying to turn that into a green uh, side of the dice, which is a trying to find solution together. That was extremely rewarding. And uh, it was such a, a big uh, success uh, that we gained from, from those two projects in Melbourne. So they've been trying to implement it more and more in the way that how they develop and how they plan uh, our, their projects uh, within these uh, organizations. So again, breaking down the silos and trying to work together across platforms. And then the last one, and I'm thinking I'm keeping track of time here on my, on my watch, is uh, bringing it all back to, uh, to uh, memory, uh, coming back on the other side of the world. Uh, it's a project that we did with uh, Melmi Stel and Stolos Kortafik just recently, uh, Barnham, uh, Behose Analyse. Um, and it was actually a Behose Analyse for several terminals in Melmi Stad. But um, we have just been extending further uh, and, and, and digging into one of the terminals and trying to even move further on that one. And again, interesting part enough, the first two projects was before Corona kicked in. And that was when we were able to physically meet uh, and, and discuss these kind of things at around a table. And, but, but then we, of course, uh, with the restrictions of Corona had to come up a new way of how we could facilitate these ways of working together. And then the, the, this uh, digitalized version of, of Akinopoli is then uh, what we're using right now. And that's also what we used at the, the host analysis. And I think what's super interesting to understand from this was that uh, it's, it's, it's not very common that we, uh, that we that people that are brought in as stakeholders can see themselves in, in, in the process uh, in such a transparent way. Uh, we often end up holding our cards quite close to our heart uh, and, 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 and don't really want to play the aces. Uh, but in this case here, uh, the different stakeholders that was brought in have seen a, a huge impact of, of how quickly uh, by, by, by meeting up uh, and facilitating uh, and co-designing in such a way, we're able to get an understanding about what kind of issues that are there, what kind of opportunities can we create together and are we able to make some quick solutions and often some of the things that we get from feedback is that this is kind of like the same as as a as hundred meetings, uh, sorry, a um, hundred emails and, and, and 20 meetings. So uh, a quite rewarding, uh, successful tool, uh, both in traffic uh, and, and other uh, urban planning uh, challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Uh, that, that's fascinating and very encouraging, uh, showing that you know it, it's applicable around the world, not just in, in one country. And I think the two things we're talking about today, about how we reconcile these different pressures on networks and also about decarbonisation, I, I think the co-creation approach is to get everybody on board is, is really crucial to both of us. So, so thank you very much indeed. So finally, in this first session, I'd like to uh, welcome Raymond Brodel from a head of uh, Department for Transport Policy, City of Hamburg if you'd like to share your slides, which are already up. Thank you very much, Great. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for the invitation and beauty from Hamburg, the city where currently the Idea at Work Congress takes place. And um, we show lots of solutions concerning road traffic, delivery, uh, rail traffic, uh, and also cycling, um, which will lead us in the, in the future. Um, what I will li would like to present is a bit different from that. I would like to uh, show you some things around um, the rail node of Hamburg, um, starting um, starting now it's starting starting with a view on what is most important for Hamburg, at least the Hamburgers think so, uh, the port of Hamburg as a, a very important source of transport demand, uh, let's say so. This does not only mean the port of Hamburg, as, uh, as the port itself, but also one of, one of the largest industrial zones in, in, 
in northern Germany, uh, or especially in Germany, logistic uh, demands and so So it is um, very important to have a look at what happens in the in the Hamburg port area. Um, the overall goal is, as we all know, um, to, um, to to reduce the travel demand, which is uh, led by, by by trucks and by by a private car use um, to lead it uh, to rail and sometimes also uh, uh, cycling. Hamburg itself is uh, not the largest railway port of Europe, so it is very special that that the that roughly half of the goods are transported, which are um, which which arrive Hamburg are transported with uh, rail to the further destinations to. Uh, Scandinavia, but especially to Southeast Europe. So we are in the center um, of, of the 10T core network, which is shown here, um, as you see, as you might know, um, on a, uh, the center of three of these uh, 10T corridors. Uh, and um, this is why it is so important uh, to uh, to have a look at the rail node in Hamburg and the and the uh, the, the rail tracks that, that lead th to Hamburg and th uh, through Hamburg as well. Um, so what are we going to do uh, within the next uh, years or even decades um, in order to give a good chance uh, for freight freight and for a person uh, to uh, take uh, the uh, uh, take the, uh, the the railways. Um, uh, we come in the next slide to the Hamburg railway node, but the railway node is uh, is very important. But you have to get get uh, to this node, uh, and uh, if we look from Malmo and Copenhagen. You see um, the measure number two, uh, which shows that after the construction of the Femer Bell Pixling, which is now under construction and will be. Uh, will be ready roughly 2028. It is important to have, uh, have it strengthened uh, the so-called hinterland connection. I don't really like this expression, but the, the connection um, from, from the from the payment about fixed link to, to Lübeck and to Hamburg to, in order to, uh, to strengthen the, um, the, the rail system in northern uh, northern Germany. But um, uh, when you look from Marne and Copenhagen to the south, uh, you will be you will find that the world does not end at Hamburg, um, especially it goes further to the south, which is very important for the Hamburg uh, harbor. And so it is very important to to uh, to to gain strength to the uh, railway corridor to the south to Hanover and Bremen. These project consists of several um, different sub-projects, uh, which will um, have, have the, uh, the goal to, uh, to uh, find more resilience to the railway network, to find more capacity for uh, transport for, for goods and for passengers, for long-distance long passengers and for, for uh, suburban rail passengers, um, and also have a good alternative for different Different directions, for example, from Hamburg to Berlin, uh, which is now on the on the track from uh, 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 via via this 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 way to the to, to Wittenberg, and we love to uh, to to have an opportunity to uh, to take place um, a bit further in the south, so that when the railway is blocked, then there's an alternative. So th these are the the most important projects in northern Germany. Uh, which is very, very um, uh, important for everything that happens in, uh, in, in, in North Europe and Central Europe, so uh, to, to keep the railway node uh, in function. What especially happens in Hamburg right now, um, uh, you see two axes from Hamburg to, to the Northeast and to the Northwest, both lead to Denmark. Um, the northwest one to via, via, via Kiel and Flensburg to Jutland, and the other one, as I named it uh, a few minutes ago, uh, via the Femur Belt Fixling. And the most important project to enhance this uh, this uh, axel is um, the project number three, the Rapid Transit Railway S4, which is under construction right now. Uh, we discussed it with Malmö in Copenhagen a few years ago. So this project is now uh, uh, being realized uh, and will enhance the, um, the railway 
uh, section there from 2029 on when the Feynman Belt fixed link is ready and the uh, the freight trains are running exactly across this these, these tracks. A similar thing will happen in the uh, in the Hamburg Northwest, uh, the so-called S4 West. Uh, we are not quite sure what we are, uh, what what kind of project it will be. We do it with our neighbors in uh, in Schleswig-Holstein, uh, but the idea is similar to what I told you in the in the S4 East project, so that the uh, the, the suburban railway will leave the. Um, uh, the, the 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 existing tracks to, uh, to to different different ones in order to enhance uh, uh, the the railway node uh, itself itself. We have two more projects in addition, which are quite new, and I don't think that you are quite aware of these these projects, but they are very important to to get uh, the capacity done to for 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 new trains, long distance ones, but also regional trains. From uh, uh, from Kiel and Flensburg uh, to the Hamburg uh, main station, but also the second one from Hamburg to the south, which is very important also for the freight trains. And one of well, is the the the, the um, uh, enhancement of the uh, of the uh, connecting uh, rails between Hamburg Central Station and Altena, where most of the trains from uh, from Kiel and Flensburg run through. Um, and uh, the idea is adding two tracks, but this will not happen uh, quite in the city center. So uh, these additional tracks will go underground uh, in uh, decay or so. But this is the most important project to enhance the Hamburg um, uh, Central Station and uh, the tracks into uh, into uh, the north uh, into the northwest. The second one is the uh, the, the view to the south. To Hamburg Harburg and further to Hanover and Bremen, um, the upgrade of the mainline railway between uh, the south of Hamburg to from four to six tracks, existing four to, uh, to to in the future six tracks. So um, this will lead to um, to the fact that the uh, the goods and passengers will be shifted from 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 road to rail. This is what we hope and what we what we aim at, um, so that we uh, create more space for, for 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 different means of transport on the streets and on the roads. Um, and this will be the the uh, uh, our project for the future. And I say thank you very much for your and attention. And uh, I'd like to discuss with you all the measures that we have been taken. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Magnus. Um, I, sorry, Raymond, um, as, as you say, I, I hadn't realized uh, the extent to which uh, rail traffic from your port, uh, sorry, traffic from port was going by rail. Um, and, and as you say, this is not only important for, for freight, but also for longer distance, distance and local passenger traffic as well. And I think that links back to uh, what Magnus was saying about part of the solution is to uh, provide more rail services and better quality rail services to take pressure off the road network, both in the city and also regionally and nationally. I think they're tied together very well, thank you. And uh, stressing the importance of the freight component as well uh, is something that we need to consider. Um, I've got a quick question for Daniel or Francesco. We were gonna do a, a Mentimeter question. Um, is it possible to put it up on the screen so while we're having a discussion, people will be thinking about it and then we can look at the result at the end or is that a bit too complicated? We can do that, uh, Peter, we can do that. Okay, so we'll put the question up now and then people can have a think about it while we're just having a discussion. And then, then uh, when we finish the discussion, just before we go on to the second session, then Francesco can, can show us the results if that's okay. Um, so the, the usual thing is um, there's either the, the code that Q code you can read, QR code you can read, or if you go to slido.com, um, then you'll be asked to enter a number. Um, and then if you enter 707639, um, then you'll see um, a simple question to ask, which um, is actually um, considering the city and the region in which you work, do you see that current ongoing and planned infrastructure projects are leading in the direction of the green, European Green Deal, i.e. climate neutrality by um, 2050? So if you, if you, uh, those of you uh, have got access to the phone or, oh, there, it, it's on there now. There we are. Um, so let, let, I'd just like to go back to, to the panel. Um, just perhaps start with this issue about sort of urban interurban um, in, in two senses. One is we heard particular 
uh, particularly uh, in, in the case of Melbourne, but I think in other cases, I suspect it's the same in, uh, for example, in Hamburg as well, that in the city, within the city, the aim is to uh, reduce traffic levels, um, encourage alternative modes, but also improve livability, well-being, that sort of thing. Whereas, as we've heard, in the sense that, understandably, on the interurban national networks, the aim is on economic efficiency and, and so on, which, which gives it a, a slightly different emphasis. Um, and I'm wondering about the, the extent to which there is cooperation uh, between the, the national TENTI operator and, and, the, and the city. Um, I was thinking of road, but actually uh, Raymond's presentation reminded me that um, uh, I'm noticing in one or two countries in Eastern Europe, for example, in Romania, there are cities where there is a national network that comes into the center of the city, but it's seen as a national network. And it's not actually being opened up for suburban trains on that route because it's a national network. So in a sense, I guess the same issue can arise. It doesn't look as though it is in Hamburg, but in other cases, it can arise on the, arise on the rail side as well about not really joining up the, the local and, and the sort of national. But would anybody like to co comment on this issue about um, sort of tensions, but also opportunities for cooperation or collaboration or whether that's an issue that needs further addressing? Uh, maybe I could start with you, uh, Magnus. Well, uh... There is a, a tension, I'd say, but we also have a very uh, good cooperation, I'd say. Uh, the, the thing is that um, the national level has its uh, rail authority, which are, uh, uh, how do you say, dictators when it comes to uh, uh, deciding the timetables for the train traffic. So both the regional level and the local level and all the businesses that wants to uh, 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 have train traffic, either it's a passenger traffic or freight traffic, they just have to sit and wait for the decision. And then the decision comes, okay, we can have two commuter trains per hour, no more. And uh, of course, the city wants uh, more commuter trains. But the state says no, because we have to uh, uh, defend the interests of the, the, uh, the Swedish industry. Mm -hmm. So it's yes, just to sit back and then we, we have tried to lobby to get more tracks built, mm -hmm. like uh, they have uh, been successful in, in Hamburg, I heard. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about on the roadside? Um, do you have much discussion with national operation yeah. on the roadside when you get to your boundary as it were of Melbourne? Yes we have that and and uh, there there is also an interesting tension between uh, uh, municipalities uh, which are mainly uh, uh, suburban municipalities uh, with commuting uh, yeah inhabitants commuting to Melbourne they are more in favor of uh, expanding the the road network to yeah. uh, with more uh, lanes and so on but the municipality of Malmö, the city of Malmö, we always try to hold these interests back because we don't have the space for this traffic inside Malmö. So uh, the national level, the road administration, they they are balancing this uh, this uh, interest conflict <laughs> within within Scania uh, very well, I think. Uh, okay. Thank until you. Until now, isn't it? Raymond, how, how about the situation um, in Hamburg? It sounds on the rail side as though you have managed quite good coordination, but is that the case? And what about on the road side? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, most of the projects uh, follow the, the overall goal to, um, to, 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 to give the change uh, from, from, uh, from motorized traffic to, uh, to public transport and, 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 and cycling. So, so um, uh, this is what I would wanted to, uh, to to express to you by um, by presenting the railway uh, things. Concerning the roads, it is uh, Hamburg is a, uh, is a, um, a situation which is uh, which is a bit tricky. I think um, Hamburg um, is a federal state, one of sixteen in Germany, um, and um, so we are. Um, responsible for a bit more than other cities in in, in, in Germany, but Hamburg is a 
is a small state, a small land um, from, from, um, from, from the, the federal point of view. So we are dependent on what happens in the surrounding lender and the surrounding states like Schleswig-Holstein and uh, Lower Saxony. Um, this is um, very much important for rail projects, but also for highway projects, if you want to, to, to name them. Um, and to uh, have more strength and more power to go to, to the federal government, it is very much important that you um, that you do it together in Northern Germany and not not by your own. So Hamburg is a, um, is, a, is, a is an important node, as I would like to point out. But uh, Hamburg is a small state in the concert of of the, of the sixteen uh, the sixteen lender, and that leads to uh, to the fact that we have. To, um, to, to express our projects concerning road, concerning uh, uh, rail uh, to the federal level uh, in common. Hmm. That just reminds me, actually, I did some work in, in Vienna a few years ago now, and obviously within Vienna itself, the policy very much is on using walking, cycling and public transport, and they have very high modal shares for those sustainable modes. But in, in, the, um, in the municipality of the south, in, in south, southern Austria, I'm not sure, just below Vienna, there it is very much car focused. And, and so you get cases where you get motorways coming up to the border, effectively, of, of Vienna because of those different priorities in, 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 different, in different regions with different uh, makeup of population and, and politics and so on. I guess that, that becomes an important factor as well. Um, when, something else, Magnus, when you were talking, actually, you were saying that, um, if I understood you correctly, that on the, uh, effectively on the 10T network, on the motorway network, you were taking out a lane uh, of, for car traffic and giving it as a bus lane, um, which obviously has the benefit of encouraging buses, but I think it, you said it was also reducing car capacity to come into Melmo uh, and therefore take some pressure off the network. And in London, I know they tried similar things. They were going to have a lane on the M2, which I showed you, which was going to be for coaches and heavy goods vehicles, but we tend to do cost benefit analysis and they showed the disbenefits to the delays to the car were greater than the benefits to the time savings for the coaches and HGV. Do you, do you have to do a same sort of exercise or? Um... No, um, I, I wasn't um, giving you all the details here, but uh, our project uh, is uh, inside of the outer ring road. So it's on a stretch that uh, the city is responsible of. Oh, right. okay. And uh, we got uh, uh, financial support from the uh, national level of 75% mm -hmm. to uh, enable this bus lane, but mm -hmm. we were not allowed to decrease uh, car capacity. Mm -hmm. So what we did, uh, we, 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 we had the same road width so uh, two lanes and then uh, uh, how do you say a spare lane for yeah we say hard shoulder or emergency yeah, lane the hard shoulder yeah hmm. we use this hard shoulder okay. to uh, create a third lane which was okay. dedicated for buses right so uh, and and uh, but we couldn't uh, so in in some terms it is a, a expansion of, of road capacity but as hmm. we uh, as we didn't change the traffic signal, signaling no. when okay. you reach the end of the motorway, no. there was no expanded road capacity. No, but sure. it's more like a, a, um, um, a net where we mm -hmm. let the bus through yeah. and, and hold the car traffic back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, I understand. Um, Rasmus, I'm just thinking that uh, you know quite often these investment decisions or management decisions are based on modeling and cost benefit analysis and things like that, which have their biases. I guess the work you do co-creating with a wide range of stakeholders perhaps gives politicians a different basis on which to make brave political decisions. Would you like to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, for sure you're right. It's, it's, it's very hard. What, what, what we often do is, is uh, sell software and hardware is much easier for people to understand. You know, you buy a Mac computer in the local store and you could feel it. It's uh, it's it's really, but but it's it's actually the stuff that you're putting on the computer that makes it really work. Hmm. And sometimes it's hard what I do uh, to measure in the same way. You know, you can count cars, but of course we're also luckily now starting to count people and bikes and so forth. And that way we can somehow validate why we should split, make the traffic mode split. Uh, but it is very much important to gain the trust, uh, not just uh, upwards in the hierarchy, but also downwards. And I think that's. Uh, 
often what we find is that when we are engaged in many cities, it's about trying to find as a way to validate what we do and, and what the politicians are doing in such a way that they are not <laughs> afraid, to, so they can avoid the shitstorm afterwards, basically. And I mean, that's uh, you know set uh, very much on the point is that this is one of the problems is that we are, we're tending to see what I'm hearing Raymond and, and, and Manus talking about is that it becomes a battle between, you know, we're not allowed to do this or we are not giving this permission or, or we, you know, it's, it's, it's very much this thing about how can we bring these issues together around the table and solve them uh, in such a way that nobody feels that they yeah. neglected anything. Uh, but it is extremely very much uh, this, this, this importancy of trust uh, and then validation of what, what the, the stakeholders are doing. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense. No, I agree with you entirely. I've, I've done some similar work in the UK and you can't always satisfy anybody, but I've had people say, okay, in the end, I didn't get what I wanted, but my view was respected and therefore I accept the decision. That's we also important. call it democratic design, right? Yeah. And we all know that the, you know eventually uh, mm. that the polls can go both ways and, and, and mm. the votes uh, can end in, in, in different Mm. In different situations, but but we are accepting the democratic uh, the democratic yeah. system, and mm -hmm. I think that that's what we have to introduce more. And we've been focusing mm -hmm. very much, way too much for many years uh, on designing cities uh, for people uh, or to people. But of course, we need to focus. How can we design cities with people? With and that's not yeah. just uh, yeah. the, the common yeah. man, but it's all the different stakeholders uh, working yeah. in different silos. I think also sometimes there's dissonance and a, a misjudging and misunderstanding. I remember years ago, there was a Eurobarometer poll done in, across Europe asking citizens what they thought should be the priority in city centre. Should it be cars or, or buses and pedestrians and cyclists? Um, and most people said they thought it should not be cars. And then they asked what they thought the politicians thought. And the view was most politicians think it should be cars. And they then asked politicians, what do you personally think? And the politician said, Personally, I think it should, we should we should reduce car use and we should encourage sustainable modes. What do you think the public think? Oh, they want to keep cars. So there was this sort of <laughs> misunderstanding. I, I don't know if you've come across that in your work as well. I mean, it's it, it's crazy also often to find these misunderstandings about, and it's basically because we don't know, and that's why we have to ask. And when we start to engage and also engage a bit, engaging shouldn't be. Uh, hard thing and often we find that many people uh, higher up in the in the deciding system are afraid of making engagements simply because they're afraid of uh, that they're not able to deliver of what people uh, want or is it their wishes and yeah. it's just very important to start off to sell it's not a wishing list mm -hmm. but it's about engaging you to understand what you what you dream of and what you don't dream of uh, yeah. to align to align the stars mm -hmm. a bit better right i'm pretty sure that it's much easier for politicians to get reelected if he's pointing at some of the things that people actually yeah. want instead of just imagining what they want. Yeah, I think the other problem in Britain is that where there isn't a, a history of doing this, a local authority person, the only contact they have with the public is when they complain. Um, and therefore they assume everybody's hostile until you actually go out and engage with them. But anyway, thank you very much. That, that's, been, that's been great. So thank you very much, Resman, uh, Raymond and Magnus. And I think when we get on to the second session, obviously the issues about co-creation and so on will come up then. So yes, Francesco has anticipated my, uh, my next point was to see uh, what the result was of the, of the poll there. So basically um, what people are saying is in the context of the achieving climate neutrality and the European Green Deal at the moment. Um, most of the projects that are being invested in in the pipeline are not really at the moment orientated towards that end. And I think that takes us nicely into the second session. So thank you again, Rasmus, Raymond and Magnus. So we're going to the second session to talk about the implications of the decarbonisation agenda for the 10T and urban node policies. And first of all, I'm very pleased to welcome Isabel Mice. Uh, from the Tenti Atlantic Corridor. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, you are very welcome. I hope you can hear me and see me. Yes, we can do both, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, I will be rather uh, short, but of course I'm uh, fully available for uh, questions and uh, discussions. So indeed, uh, in the current TNT uh, regulation, so the TNT is the 
trans-European transport uh, network, we have uh, some provisions related to urban nodes, but, and we are revising that regulation. And uh, we expect to, um, the commissions to adopt our proposal of a revised regulation on the 14th of December. So it is coming up quite soon. But first of all, I would like to put it in the right uh, context, which is primarily the Green Deal, as well as the uh, Sustainable and Smart uh, Mobility Strategy, which was adopted uh, last uh, December. So first of all, uh, you know what is the Green Deal. It is the uh, strategy and the roadmap to make the EU a carbon neutral um, economy by uh, 2050. And uh, this cannot be realized if um, transport does not play an important role. And one of the things that we need to achieve in transport is to move um, especially freight transport away from road to less polluting modes, uh, like um, inland waterways or rail. But of course, passengers also have a role to play. And there as well, we need to make a model shift away from road to a more sustainable modes. So that is one important point of uh, context. And the second point, as I, I, as I mentioned, the sustainable and smart mobility strategy is basically more concrete uh, targets and goals to, um, um, to achieve so that transport plays a role in the Green Deal. Just to uh, list a few examples of such goals, the rail uh, freight traffic should increase its market share by uh, 50% uh, by uh, 2030 and should double it by 2050. The transport um, by inland waterways or uh, short sea shipping should increase its market share by 25% by 2030 and 50% by 2050, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have a whole set of um, concrete goals to achieve so that transport does contribute its uh, fair share to the uh, Green Deal um, objective. So, um, how do we translate that in the revision of the uh, TNT uh, regulation? Well, I said that um, we are working on it and uh, we hope to have it adopted by the European Commission uh, on the 14th of December, which then should be together with the adoption of the, the, the new urban mobility communication and action plan. And indeed, as we will see uh, in a few minutes, there will be uh, quite a strong uh, link. But what can we expect um, from this revision in terms of, compared to what we have today? Basically four uh, key points. The first one is that there will be a significantly higher focus on rail freight with the integration of the, uh, the rail freight corridors and the core network corridors. So those are two existing parallel concepts, which we want to make uh, to merge basically. And th they would be merged into so-called European transport uh, corridors. And by doing so, rail, especially for the transport of freight, would become an even more important part of the TNT policy. The second point is that we aim to accelerate the completion of parts of the comprehensive network, which for the moment has as a deadline 2050, but those parts that we want to accelerate, we would give them the deadline of 2040, so two years ahead for uh, being realized. The third point is related to urban nodes. We want to give them um, a much bigger role uh, in the revised uh, TNT regulation. First of all, we want um, to increase their number by quite a, a significant um, proportion. Currently, we have 80, 80 urban nodes which are recognized as such uh, in the regulation. 
And in the proposal of the Commission, we will have around 460, so from 88 to 460, it is indeed quite an increase. And uh, uh, secondly, and most importantly, we also want to uh, set new uh, stricter obligations upon urban nodes, including developing and adopting a sustainable urban mobility plan and working with sustainable urban mobility indicators. That is probably the most um, ambitious change in the regulation, um, in the revised version in the regulation that uh, we will be proposing. And the fourth and last uh, point, uh, which will change quite a bit, is that we will put even more focus on alternative fuels, as well as on the greener modes, such as uh, rail, inland waterways, and to a certain extent, uh, maritime transport. And when it comes to roads, which we are really going away from, the focus um, shifts and um, will become placed rather on safety um, provisions. So I hope that I was clear enough on uh, trying to give you um, a short picture of what we envisage for the revised TNT regulation, bearing in mind that I'm, I am talking about the proposal which the Commission will make. Of course, I cannot preempt what the Council and Parliament will do with it. Um, will they accept all our changes? Will they, on the contrary, want to, um, to go halfway? Or will they want to be even more ambitious? That is extremely hard to uh, preempt. And um, I don't think we, uh, we, should do, we, we should do so today, but at least those points are what um, my, the, the units in which I'm working um, are working on and preparing for the 14th of December. Let me quickly check because I saw some messages in the chat. Um, okay, well, I'm not so sure it is for me uh, specifically, so I guess we can come back to that uh, at the end of in the Q&A part of this uh, session. So um, thanks very much for your attention. And I suppose that I now give the word to the uh, European Cyclist uh, Federation. That's right. Thank you very much. Very clear, Isabel. Thank you very much. Very clear. And we'll come back to that in discussion. Very yeah. interesting points to pick up. Yeah, so we'll go on now to European Cyclist Federation. Alexander Kuczynski, who's going to give us, we haven't heard much about cycles yet. We've heard about We've heard about rail, we've heard about buses and coaches, we've heard about cars, so now we're going to hear about cycles. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm from the Cycling Federation, so I will talk about integrating cycling in the trans-European network. Uh, we think there is no way to really decarbonize the transport sector without recognizing the role of cycling, and TNT is basically the the European transport policy. So it would be a shame not to use this opportunity to better integrate uh, cycling in the regulation. As for now, cycling is already mentioned in the current uh, legislation, uh, the current TNT guidelines. Uh, we have a part of uh, one of the recitals, which uh, it is basically a quite complicated way to say that if you're building a big, uh, for example, motorway bridge or a rail bridge, it might make sense to include also a cycle, cycle path on the bridge to, to build it together and not to have it to do it uh, separately. In practice, it's, it's, uh, they, it's just, it's just a recital and it's just a recommendation. It's not, uh, it's not obliging. Some, uh, some member states follow it, some don't. In practice, we also see many examples when the, the TNT projects, they are not only not using synergies, not also not uh, improving the situation for cyclists, not taking this opportunity to also provide uh, infrastructure for active mobility, but uh, sabotaging existing cycle routes or sabotaging existing cycle networks. Uh, this is quite an old example, but it's, uh, it's uh, very clearly shows the problem. This is the city of Seged in Hungary, 
and the green lines are is the psycho network and uh, on the right you can see quite well developed main psycho network in the city on the left um, uh, psycho path connecting Seged with the towns of Damascus and Morahalom. And in between, there is a gap created by the construction of a motorway from Budapest to Belgrade. And you can, uh, basically when the motorway was constructed, no one thought, uh, uh, well, people had this attitude, I'm building a long distance uh, motorway it's in the middle of nowhere, I don't have to think about cycling. But then you come, the result is that the suburbs, the towns uh, outside uh, Seged have been separated from, uh, from, from the center of the city. Uh, this, is, this used to be both uh, inter, uh, a long distance uh, uh, European cycle route, the Iron Curtain Trail, and uh, it was also used for commuting by, uh, by the inhabitants of the, of the small towns to, to the city. Now it's, they are left with very expensive and complicated problem to, to resolve. Uh, this is quite an old example, but also in the projects, ongoing projects, the newer projects, and also on the rail network, we see the same patterns. Uh, the, you, you see on this picture an end of a psychopath. It's an EU-funded psychopath under the Integrated Territorial Investments Envelope. And it has another uh, part of this, uh, of this route behind the rail tracks on uh, behind this, uh, this, uh, uh, this line that you see. But uh, in between, there is a, a rail line also modernized basically in the same time, upgraded from, two to quad, uh, from double track to quadruple track, uh, but not including any passage for, for cycling in this area. So the, the two, two, uh, two parts are not connected. Uh, the, this whole section, it was about uh, 10 kilometers of quadruple track, passing three towns, 90,000 inhabitants. And the, uh, there are five stations in this area. So because it's quite densely populated and the designers, the, the planners for this, for this project, they included only one cycle crossing on this uh, 10 kilometers and a lot of connections are practically uh, cut. So you, you, we see that the Tenti projects, they even if they if they are on the sustainable side, if they even if uh, it means uh, investing on in the rail, it might result in shifting some of the long distance traffic from road to rail on the distance of 200, 300 kilometers. But on the on the local scale, it often means that uh, people are encouraged to use their cars for short trip because cars have five crossings and bicycle cyclists only one on this on on this uh, stretch. Of course, not all the projects uh, are as bad as that. There are examples where the synergies were used to some extent. Uh, this is uh, a Auto taken along the high speed train uh, leaving Brussels to the to the east in the direction of uh, uh, Germany. And when the uh, railroad was uh, modernized, uh, there were a lot of so called service roads built to maintain access to agriculture to the houses along the railroad. And uh, a few years later, uh, those uh, uh, those service roads were found perfect to to create a cycle route uh, connecting the small uh, the municipalities along the railroad because the car traffic on those, uh, uh, those roads is really minimal and uh, the surface is very good. So cyclists started use it, using it and then, and then it turned into an official uh, cycle highway connecting Brussels and Leuven. The problem is that quite a few uh, elements had to be added later. For example, you can, you can see a billboard presenting a tan tunnel uh, in one of the bridges that was also completely rebuilt during the modernization. Uh, it would be much cheaper and uh, easier to in integrate it from the very beginning than to have to demolish this part of the bridge and then redo the tunnel for uh, cyclists. And this is one of the lessons learned. Basically, the, the earlier you start thinking about cycling, the, the cheaper it is. And uh, from the other side, in, if you think about the cycle network, uh, go, going across uh, going across this kind of barriers, going across those, uh, uh, 
those dentary roads, dentary rails, it's the most expensive, it's often the most expensive part of developing a cycle route, a cycle network. And uh, it's, uh, it can, it, the bridge that is now built to cross the Brussels ring road is more expensive than the rest of the route between Brussels and Leuven. Whenever we see that uh, this potential of, for example, rail corridors is used to, is, uh, is, is utilized, uh, we see that the, the, it's, uh, it's very popular among cyclists. This is, uh, one, this is the cycle highway connecting Arnhem and Nijmegen, partially along the Tenti rail, partially along a, a motorway. Uh, this, this section carries more than 6,000 uh, cyclists on average uh, per day. We think that uh, well, we would like to see more of those good practice and less uh, less of those examples when the anti projects create barriers, and uh, we think it should be a general principle where to integrate integrate elements of walking and cycling infrastructure in the anti networks to analyze what are the needs in the area that it's crossed. Not only look at the cities 200 kilometers away, but also what's, what's happening in between and how to integrate those, uh, those uh, uh, smaller uh, towns in between. Do I still have 30 seconds? You do, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So maybe one last remark. We, uh, in the more project, uh, we are focusing on urban nodes and also in this discussion today. Uh, and uh, it is right that the potential for cycling is biggest in and around uh, big cities. And uh, they have many, uh, many more advantages in, in cities, uh, for example, because of the competition for space and cycling is very space efficient. Uh, but uh, we see the same problems happening also on outside urban areas. Uh, across the EU, more than 40% of cyclist fatalities happen in rural areas. This road that you see on the picture is also a tenty road uh, in Lithuania. And it's uh, not a motorway, it's basically the only asphalted road in the area which combines uh, heavy truck traffic, which combines uh, agricultural vehicles and also pedestrians and cyclists just connecting towns and villages along it. And uh, we think it would be better to have a general, uh, a general way to address this integration of active mobility into the Tenti project than to have special regulations which only uh, allow cycling and, and walking within urban nodes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to that in the discussion. Thank you, that, that's very informative. So the third presenter uh, in this session is Lucien Zagen from Eurocity. So over to you. Thank you. So I hope you're seeing my screen now. We are, yes, thank you. You're, okay, right. that's, that's great, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, thank you very much for, for the invitation. So for those that uh, know me for, for longer, I used to work at European Integrated Project in, uh, in Romania, which is part of the MORE consortium. So I had the occasion to work on a number of uh, occasional tasks in MORE. But I always wanted to catch up with the more uh, general concept of the project and the results in, in the project. So that's offer exactly the, uh, the opportunity for that. In the meantime, I moved to uh, Eurocities, where I work on two projects dedicated to well-connected and multimodal urban nodes, Move21 and ScaleUp. They just started before, before the summer, so we're still setting up the, uh, the right structures and activities. Uh, but that's what makes it uh, very relevant. And actually, uh, we actively considered taking up the legacy of more and the previous uh, uh, project vital nodes. In MOVE21, there are involved uh, cities like Oslo, Gothenburg, and Hamburg, and also we have a, a very in-depth replication program which involves the city of uh, Munich, Bologna, and Rome, and scale-up Antwerp, Madrid, and, and Turku are involved. And uh, I'll just mention a number of activities because they are, are relevant here. So one thing is that uh, 
uh, once we had some results in the project, we want to convene uh, an urban nodes forum. Uh, urban nodes forum were also done as part of vital nodes and as part as, uh, as more as far as I know. So we'll continue uh, this practice. The idea is to bring together and to disseminate the results and the practices developed in, uh, in Move 21 and scale up to all urban nodes, 88 at the moment when we wrote the proposal. In the meantime, we learned there are 460. And maybe another thing which is very relevant given the cities uh, uh, present today, there will be an, uh, 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 an observatory dedicated to the Scandinavian Mediterranean uh, corridor that will be uh, managed by our colleagues at, at Polis, but that's very relevant uh, given that we have uh, Malmö, Copenhagen and Hamburg at the table. So uh, three things, I, I will go a bit more higher level, but that's nice because it brings together all the issues discussed today. And I want to address uh, three issues. I will try to do it quickly. So first we know that we all know the definition of urban nodes in the current regulation. I guess uh, in terms of uh, concept, it won't be significantly uh, changed, but why they are uh, relevant uh, within the 10T policy is because they are the starting point and final destination for passenger and freight moving on the, uh, on the transport network, on the EU transport ne uh, network. And also they are the point of transfer with, uh, within or between uh, different transport modes. Now, the first issue I want to, to address is policy coherence. Of course, it's a, a huge effort of integrating two policy domains with their own constraints. There is an area of, uh, of overlap, but there's also a high risk of, uh, uh, of incoherence there. And I'll soon explain uh, why. So the 10 policy ensured improved European interconnections for, for passengers and goods. And of course, that's, uh, that's something desirable. It brings economic uh, opportunities and, and so on. However, at the urban nodes of the network, there are uh, negative uh, consequences of traffic, congestion, poor air quality, livability uh, issues, and, and so on. And therefore, cities and regions need to develop sustainable transport systems to mitigate uh, the negative consequences of, uh, of traffic. And indeed, uh, the current NT regulation stresses the importance of the integration of the, uh, the urban nodes into the NT network and the need for, for mitigation. So that's, uh, that's observed at the level of, uh, uh, of the current regulation. But then when we think about it, we're having to do with different uh, planning paradigms and actually different transport outcomes. As we've seen, for example, in the um, uh, car traffic uh, data uh, graphics from uh, Manchester and around that Peter was showing. So um, uh, when we have that, when we have this uh, very different planning paradigm, ensuring policy coherence is not trivial and it's something that should be always uh, you know, enforced and looked, uh, looked after. So on the 10 side, the focus is on territorial coverage, on connectivity across uh, EU territory, eliminating bottlenecks, um, and still maximizing the travel speeds and minimizing user costs are, are, are some of the, of the key goals. Of course, there are also uh, efforts towards uh, decarbonization of the transport sector altogether. There is looking for um, uh, less emission intensive technologies, multimodality and, and so on. On the urban mobility side, the shift towards sustainable mobility paradigm, paradigm seems to be faster. And uh, as we've seen, there are already stage create stage two and stage, uh, stage three cities. So the focus is more on accessibility uh, and not on mobility as such. So accessibility being the uh, people overall ability to reach services and activities. There is a focus on sustainable and equitable transport system, efficient integration of sustainable modes and a more accessible land use. So on, on the urban mobility side, also there is a, a, a focus of, and a, uh, a, an opportunity to integrate it with, uh, with land use. Now, um, the second issue I want to address is multimodal hubs. We hear them invoked uh, all the time. There are research programs already uh, addressing them, but they are key into uh, 
assuring the interconnection and integration across the different uh, transport system, both for passengers uh, and freight. So it's not only bringing together two or three or, uh, or more transport modes, but it's also ensuring spatial integration and connectivity because uh, multimodal hubs bring together uh, various territorial level and uh, transport systems set up at, at a different territorial level. It's about intermodal infrastructure because the shift towards a uh, different mode, uh, different mode is made in, in, in such hubs. Also, they allow for network optimizations because uh, multimodal hubs are not uh, uh, independent elements in the transport ecosystem, but are part of the network in which uh, uh, nodes have to perform uh, jointly. I also mentioned here park and ride facilities as a type of multimodal hubs. Uh, I think they are uh, important instruments for, for cities. I know there are studies showing that they are actually traffic generators, but as all uh, mobility solutions, the context is key. So. Uh, 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 it's a way of keeping cars away from context in which uh, uh, moving doesn't doesn't require uh, a car. So uh, uh, they are uh, uh, key uh, case studies of multimodal hubs. Uh, now, uh, as always in multimodal hubs, user friendliness, convenience, seamless transfer. These are important. Bringing in the hubs flexible services because it's not always. Uh, mathematics, like the needs of the, of the different users are not mathematics, so uh, flexible services are important, and also making them um, um, uh, looked after by, uh, uh, by users. Uh, they could be ma made attractive to your users by bringing uh, additional services like e-charging or solutions for less my delivery, as we've seen uh, pilots um, along the, the, the last year. Now, the, the uh, third issue I want to discuss is the role of cities as, as uh, uh, urban nodes. Of course, integrating the two levels brings on uh, challenging issues in the field of freight and logistics, passenger flow, sustainability, livability, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and so integration of urban nodes into the 10 network require an integrated policy answer, which often goes beyond the city level. And that is important. So cities have uh, responsibilities in order to, as urban nodes and as a contribution to the uh, efficiency of the network in what concerns mitigating the negative consequences of traffic, integrating the large infrastructure into the city fabric so that don't become uh, barriers. Also, uh, because um, uh, most of this structure are established at uh, the functional urban uh, area, establishing an effective cooperation structure to, uh, as a governance structure for, for this area and in order to enable cooperation for um, sustainable solutions here. It's also in the responsibility of the cities. Also, multimodal hubs to ensure connectivity beyond the city uh, area to the functional urban area, the regional and the tenty uh, area. It's in the responsibility of the city. So, given all this burden on cities, it's key that cities have a more predominant role in uh, in tenty policy more generally. And Focusing just on the corridors won't deliver the 10 uh, objectives as urban nodes are key to the functionality and the efficiency of the network. But that was already observed at the level of the, of the previous regulations now. And I'm happy to see that the EU decisions makers are, are following on this. But then when it's something that I mentioned earlier, it seems to be a different pace towards the carbonization uh, in the two policy uh, areas. So uh, policy making at the 10 level should consider cities' ambitions concerning sustainable uh, mobility and, and decarbonization. And here again, we have uh, cities at the table that set up to become climate neutral before 2030. So in just a few years or even uh, earlier, if I remember uh, correctly, Malmo is one year earlier. Um, also, maybe one thing to, to be mentioned, because uh, Isabel mentioned uh, this uh, uh, obligation uh, for, for cities having to do with the role of uh, 10 uh, urban nodes. This should come maybe with a package with programs and funding that is needed in implementing those, uh, uh, those obligations. And of course, there, 
there is a CEF connecting Europe facilities funding available to, to cities, but even when cities access those sort, sorts of funds, it's uh, as a result of prioritization done at the national level. So actually cities don't necessarily have a, have a say uh, there. And now to, to, to step down a bit and make uh, this higher level things more, uh, uh, more concrete, I'll just give a very, very quick example, which I like a lot. And actually, I, I think uh, um, it deserves a more in-depth um, um, study. So it's completing the road ring in Antwerp. Maybe you know the, uh, the, uh, the case. It started some, uh, I think, uh, more than a decade ago uh, with this intention of completing the ring road. And there was a lot of opposition from the citizens. And that resulted in a very participatory, participatory governance model for uh, realizing it. And of course, the project now is not uh, what was initially intended, but much more. So they, uh, Antwerp got a lot of prizes for, uh, for this participatory um, cooperation model. But it's not about that I want to, uh, to talk to today. The project ended up uh, as a result of this involvement of, of citizens not being just about closing the ring road, but uh, adding uh, a, a number of complementary projects, the livability projects, as the city calls them, adding green areas and parks uh, in the surroundings of, uh, of the ring road, um, active measures for emission and noise mitigation, integrating the large in many cases in when it's close to inhabited areas if it's underground and actually there are parks uh, uh, over it um, uh, encouraging sustainable mode so it's not only a, a ring road for uh, for car traffic but it integrates uh, some park and ride facilities some cycling lanes uh, along the uh, the green areas and and so on so uh, yeah, I uh, Lucy, we'll something. have to stop there. Sorry, we'll have to stop there on time. You've, I Just think you've counted second. three slides on each hand, actually, not three slides altogether. Yes, that's true. Uh, only one sentence I will say about about uh, these projects because there is um, uh, coming up on this by by the city. So now, uh, as part of scale up, Antwerp plans. Uh, to turn the ring road uh, into a highway for green energy. So they try to use to, to develop a series of, of pilots that will investigate how the ring road can function as a carrier for sustainable energy, heat and uh, water to deliver to the city region. So um, once we'll have results uh, along that, I will be happy to, to report further. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very long sentence, but thank you very much. Great, okay, <laughs> thank you. So um, let, let me start with Isabel. I, I don't know, Isabel, whether you were able to sit in on the previous presentation, but Raymond talked about what they'd be doing in Hamburg, both for local and long distance rail transport. And if you weren't uh, able to do then maybe Raymond can send you a presentation because I think that's a really good example of what you were talking about. But one question I wanted to ask you was that um, in cities, there's a lot of discussion about trying to reduce the need for travel. Um, and there's this idea of avoid, shift, improve, that shifting is shifting mode, improving is decarbonisation of fuel, etc. But avoid is actually trying to, as uh, Lucian said, replace mobility with accessibility, enabling people to achieve things without having to travel or travel very far. So, for example, today we're doing this online. We haven't all flown or, or taken a plane mm -hmm. to one place. Um, and I wondered whether does that feature intensity thinking at all, because traditionally, it's almost been as though more travel and more traffic is a good sign because it shows the economy is growing. Is there a sense that there might also be an avoid strategy at the 10T level? Not really, uh, but uh, at the same time, the TNT policy does not um, spur um, increased uh, traffic. So I think it's really neither of the two cases. It is rather neutral uh, on that front. Um, why? Because it's essentially a, a transport infrastructure policy, so, but it is not seeking to increase infrastructure, it is seeking to have the right infrastructure in place at the right places. Um, of course, um, I think it's a, we think it's a good, uh, good thing that there would be less um, traffic to start with, especially when it comes to people, perhaps less freight traffic would 
probably be a, a rather negative sign in terms of the economy, but certainly less uh, people's traffic is, is probably a good thing. We don't really address it in the TNT regulation, but we also don't go against it. Um, it's more that, that the, um, when people do travel, then the infrastructure has to be available. For example, if you have to go to a meeting in person, then rather than taking your car, there should be a, 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 a reliable rail line, uh, electrified rail line available, that, that sort of things. So it is not really addressing the point, but it's, it's also not going against it, for sure. Okay, thank you. I mean, it might be that because of COVID and other things that people are talking about localizing supply chains to have mm. greater security. So if people localize supply chains, obviously that will reduce freight trip lengths. Um, and, right. and therefore it might have a, an effect in that way as well. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that is true as well. Yeah. Although we need to see whether that materializes or not. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Alexander, I was thinking the point you were making about missing links longer distance cycle missing links and you showed a good example there where there was a missing link but the other point you made that I, that I think has a wider applicability is the fact that when people are building infrastructure they don't think about people being able to cross the road uh, as it were or cross the railway line and I think that's really that's really crucial and just to mention in, in Britain actually we've recognized that in the last few years um, we did a project uh, with highways um, England to actually try and measure the the severance effects of roads or railway lines and so on. And they now try and build that into the cost benefit analysis and so on. And they now have a budget of seven million, several million pounds. I think it's tens of millions of pounds to try and address local cycling and walking issues when they upgrade infrastructure to make sure there isn't that severance. Um, but um, do you think that's something that's sufficiently recognized within the work in, in 10 ts particularly about upgrading networks, making sure that, that there is good there isn't, they aren't creating severance. In fact, it's an opportunity maybe to create more cross links so that communities can travel locally more sustainably. Yeah, definitely this is the direction we would like the 10 network to see evolving. And we know that there is uh, good work done on national or sometimes regional level. We actually quote uh, some work by Highways in Latino position paper. So uh, that's, that's uh, uh, we, we think that that's quite a lot, big change that happened. Well, maybe you don't see it uh, yet in the on the roads itself, but uh, in the in the way that thinking about uh, who the highways are for uh, in, uh, in in the UK, we, we see a big change there. We can also see the change uh, around Brussels, a big project of uh, modernizing uh, modernizing the ring road around Brussels to make it more permeable for pedestrians for cycling. Uh, for the different bridges to 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 make it, to allow people from the suburbs to cross safely into city center, so there are good examples to to learn from, and we would really like to see it reflected on the European level, so the other member states don't really have to reinvent the wheel and to learn on their mistakes and wait with. Uh, Wait and now develop all those uh, high speed railroads, develop the motorways which create those barriers, and then spend uh, again the same amount of money to remove those barriers. Yeah. Actually, Isabel, is that you were nodding? Is that something that is going to get more attention now? That, that actually barriers to people crossing, local communities crossing the 10 C network to be able to make local trips more sustainable? Is that something featuring more strongly, do you think? Well, that is hard to say. Um, well, it is a general, um, a general um, objective of the revised TNT regulation to put extra focus on safety, for sure. Um, however, it's um, it also does not the, the TNT regulation as such does not um, go into funding. Uh, so, where, uh, whether uh, or not there would be. EU uh, support, financial support from the CEF, the Connecting Europe facility for that objective. Logically, one should follow the other. So I would say that there is a, a good chance uh, that it happens, uh, but it ha it's hard to confirm because again, it's two separate pieces of legislation and the CEF two regulation uh, for 2021-2027 has been approved in June already. 
However, it does give sufficient flexibility, in my view, to, um, uh, to, to, to um, adapt the provisions of the course, of the yearly course, uh, depending on the policy objectives. So hopefully, when the revised um, TNT regulation is adopted, then the subsequent uh, SEF course can indeed take that into account. But I will not sign in blood because for the time being, um, it's really two separate things, even if, again, one should be consistent with the other. I certainly wouldn't ask for your blood, Isabel. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I guess the point is, if you know, in, in upgrading or designing a new road or rail route, to recognise that, that there is the need to build in bridges or whatever, so that, that yeah. local communities are not severed. I think that's the point. Yeah, 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 for, for sure. And, and um, also the examples that were shown about... Um, cycle lanes being taken out or you know uh, uh, hampered by, by by works on the tnt network that certainly should not happen anymore so, well that's, that's reassuring yeah do you want a quick response alexander but keep it short if you do uh, always uh, funding is very important but uh, i think the best funding is uh, the kind of funding where you don't have to spend money so to to not uh, to so what we are asking for is uh, in this, in the case of the TNT regulation, is infrastructure requirements, requirements for the infrastructure to make it, uh, to make sure that it's permeable procedures to check uh, before a project gets green lighted, uh, to check that it really doesn't uh, cut uh, the, the connections for walking, for cycling across, across the corridor. Yeah. Well, once again, we, we cannot um, put that uh, in, in the regulation because we are talking about projects and we do not know who will finance those projects. And um, we cannot also substitute for national law. But what, what we can certainly do is, and what we're doing is to put those broad objectives in the TNT regulation, and then when it comes to our own funding, so the Connecting Europe facility funding, then we have also indeed such provisions uh, in place. So you would not see self projects anymore, um, which would not live up to, to that, um, to that indeed uh, quite uh, straightforward uh, expectation. Um, but we cannot fully substitute for national law. So probably we're not going all the way that you would like us to go. Uh, I have to admit, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Lucien, uh, in, in your presentation, you covered several points. One was uh, multimodal hubs, and you had a nice picture of a multimodal hub and you showed various modes, but it struck me if we're thinking of, you know, in cities where we're talking about movement and place, hubs are also natural places, aren't they? So potentially you could also make them local community centers or, or where you've got some shops or cafes or restaurants and so on. But I think there's perhaps a tendency to think them only as a transport function, not seeing them as, as, as a new neighborhood center almost in a, in a city. Is that something that's been given much consideration? Well, we certainly are giving more considerations to multimodal hubs. Indeed, right. we are uh, asking that there are um, sufficient, a sufficient number of such hubs uh, in urban nodes, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, however, do not prescribe how they should um, be laid out and, and, mm -hmm. and the fact that they should encompass more functions than transport alone. But I think that it has become already much more mainstreamed um, that, that indeed uh, you, you, they are designed that way much more than before simply because it makes sense also to, for the convenience of people and to attract more people into, into those hubs. Yeah, so what, once again, we do not go that far in the prescriptions, essentially because we may not. <laughs> it goes a bit beyond uh, what is the competence of, of the EU in, in lawmaking, in regulation making. But I think there are, um, there are sufficient guidelines going into, into that direction to, to ensure this is indeed more and more the case. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Lucien, what do you think about that? So, uh, of course, there are different conceptions of, uh, of uh, multimodal hubs, and I could see this place component into a multimodal hub. And if we go at a certain level, even a whole city could be seen as a multimodal hub on the uh, wider network. So that's definitely possible. I'm thinking 
like really when I say multimodal hubs, I'm thinking more like uh, the the kind of transport hubs that bring several um, uh, I don't know transport modes uh, and territorial uh, levels uh, together. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I could see it uh, as that as well. So uh, I'm not sure if, I don't know, a community center or because in what sense would that be multimodal? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, sorry, a place where people will naturally come together because they're changing modes and so on, really. Yeah. I, I didn't use the right word, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm pretty sure, that, yeah, there is some sort of naturalness uh, about many of the, uh, of the hubs that actually exist in uh, in in cities, so I have uh, no doubt uh, that uh, that's part of how they evolved as uh, uh, as hubs. But I also think there is place for uh, you know planners' creativity to create uh, new such yeah. hubs to make hubs as places as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll have that as a new slogan. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much to our panelists. Um, let's move on now. So if we can put up the second question, um, if that's possible, we have the technology. I think. Yes, um, um, I'll, um, Peter. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I have here the questions uh, from uh, the audience. So no, no, sorry. Uh, I meant the the second one, the poll one. Uh, yeah, the last uh, one. Okay, the poll sorry, question. Yeah. Sorry, and then we'll move. Okay. While, while people are answering that, we'll do the question and answer. So if we just put the poll question up first, thank you. So, to what it's oh, that's interesting. <laughs> To what extent do you see a co coordination between cities and regions in terms of their ambitions for sustainable development? Is there very high coordination or, or, or no coordination effectively? Um, so while people are, and again, um, if you've already logged in, you're already the slido.com. If you join late or want to answer this one, then you just put in uh, slido.com and then that's the number you'll be asked, 707639. So while we're doing that, um, Yes, um, if, if we could have the, the any questions from the audience, that would be good, thank you. Thank you, and, Peter. And yep. if, sorry, just if we've got the people, uh, speakers from the first session as well, then uh, great if they'd like to join you as well. Thank you. Of course. Um... Uh, thank you, Peter, again, and uh, to all to all of you panelists for these two interesting and comprehensive uh, panel discussions. So, yes, we have um, a first a question from the audience that was posted at the beginning for the first panel, panel uh, session. So this question is directed to Magnus from the city of Malmo. So um, it's uh, divided in two. So uh, the first one is uh, according to uh, more report 2.3, Malmo has one of the highest cycling rates in Europe. The car traffic was also accommodated there. How would you understand this divergence of planning and reality? And uh, the second question, it says, uh, to, one ex to what extent did local policies like the expansion of networks and capacities react to the growing mobility needs of citizens? Um, for Magnus. Okay, over to you, Magnus. Uh, uh, the first question, I, I, I don't know if, it is, if it's a misunderstanding or... Uh, uh, if I don't understand the question, but uh, yes, we, we have a, a very high share of, of uh, cycling in our multimodal, uh, our um, uh, travel mode split. And uh, of course, we also have to have car traffic within the city. So I, I don't know, I don't see that there is a contradiction in those two. We don't have a very high share of car traffic, though. Uh, because we have the, the, the other modes, uh, especially cycling and, and uh, public transport. As you have a high share of cycling, does that mean you have a low share of bus and train? Um, or are those quite high as well? Uh, well, uh, the, the share, uh, so the, the intra-urban traffic is around uh, 30-35% on, on, on the uh, car mode. And, and then mm -hmm. the, the cycling is about, this is now 30-40%. And okay. then the, the rest is, is the walking and, and public transport. Yeah. So mm -hmm. compared to Stockholm, for instance, we have a, 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 a relatively low share in public transport. Yeah. But if you add uh, cycling and public transport together, then we, sure. we have a... You, you do very well. Yeah, yeah. yeah we Sorry. do well. Mm -hmm. And the second point? Yeah, I, can't, I, I didn't really 
catch that question and now i can't see the uh, the can you um, can you yeah. can you summarize the second one daniel please Yes, um, um, so Marcus, the question is, uh, to what extent uh, did local policies um, like the expansion of networks and capacities react to the growing mobility needs of citizens? That's... Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Do you mean, has the network been adapted uh, and managed differently, maybe? To what extent did local policies... Yep. Hmm. Uh, well, um, Yes, we, we uh, but we try to uh, uh, how to say how to to provide more capacity on on those uh, uh, for those modes which we want to be uh, to have higher shares. So we we want to provide more capacity and enhanced network for for cycling. And then uh, there is of course. Uh, uh, a demand for more motor traffic in some uh, areas of the city and, and especially in, in commuting. But as I, with those examples I mentioned, we, we try to not to give space for this uh, increase in, in uh, motor traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks very much. Daniel, another question? Yes. Um, we have a question. I think it's this one would be for Alexander. It's more of a technical question. It says, uh, considering the potential of cycle commuting nowadays, um, how far out or, uh, uh, or in terms of like how, how, um, how much space there should be between uh, the infrastructure, there should be between an, infra an infrastructure system uh, and uh, a separate footways. How far out in the infrastructure system should there be separate footways? Um, I understand more cycleways probably, the, considering it's about cycle commuting. The traditional uh, range for cycle commuting uh, used to be five to seven kilometers. That was when the, when the biggest potential for conventional bike. We see it uh, systematically increasing with the arrival of e-bikes. Belgium is one of the early adopters and uh, leading in terms of uh, share of uh, uh, e-bikes. And on the a free cycle highway, the one that I showed the picture along the high speed railroad, the average distance between work and uh, home for cycle commute is a bit more than 20 kilometers now. So this is, this is what the potential is for now. It may, might increase a bit more with better infrastructure. Uh, maybe it deserves a separate uh, consideration after the COVID pandemic with the popularization of uh, telework, of uh, working from home. Because if people only have to come to the office, uh, for example, two times per week, they might be more willing to spend a bit more time uh, on more time budget on the days that they actually come to the office. And uh, the fun thing about cycling is that it's not a wasted time. It's the way to get your daily exercise or weekly exercise to, to, to do this commute. So people, this is, this is often the motivation behind people uh, for people that cycle those longer distances to work. Thank you. Yeah, to take an extreme of what you just said, during the, uh, the pandemic in, in Britain, um, the places where house prices went up most quickly were places like Devon and Cornwall and Yorkshire, which are very attractive rural areas, some a long distance from London. But if you're only going to go in the office once a week or something, then, you know, you can afford to, to move much further out. So I think you're probably right. Maybe people will commute less often, but from longer distances, potentially. Um, and uh, is there another question, Daniel? Uh um, there's uh, no more questions, so we still have five minutes left. So, uh, yeah. if uh, the audience would like to pose more questions, uh, well, they're while, while they're doing that, let me just ask yep. if any of our panelists would like to reflect on anything anybody else said or from the questions or anything. If anybody wants to add anything, um, I think I can see you all on my screen, but I'm not completely sure. And uh, Peter, if I may, there is a question from Thomas uh, from your cities in the Q and A. Sorry, okay. can I jump in? <laughs> um, which I can uh, read out loud uh, is for Isabel. Uh, will, be, will there be any kind of hierarchy in the way the new TNT regulation 
will steer infrastructure development around urban nodes. Uh, for instance, by giving more room for more climate friendly transport no modes. Uh, you can find the, the question in the Q&A box if you want to read it yourself uh, Wait, from uh, Thomas from your cities. There will not really be a hierarchy as such. Uh, so there will, there, there will be different requirements for the urban nodes to meet. Um, they will all have to be met by 2030, except um, the one on uh, sustainable urban mobility plans, which will be anticipated to 2025, at least in the proposal of, of the Commission. Uh, but other than that, they are all on equal footing, and we are not um, we are not um, making a ranking of the modes of transport, for example, just like we are also not making it for outside of the urban nodes. But you can clearly deduct from um, the, the, the regulation, already the current one, but even more so the revised one, that we privileged very much the less polluting modes of transport. So de facto road always comes last, unless the investment in question is focused on increasing the security of, uh, of users. And then we are talking, of course, about the vulnerable users, not the ones behind their wheel, but uh, the ones they would come across, pedestrians, uh, cyclists, uh, etc. So there is already a clear, but it's overall, it's not only for the urban nodes, a clear focus on the less polluting modes of transport which basically are rail, inland waterways, and to a certain extent, maritime transport. And then only comes road and aviation, but uh, we hardly do anything on aviation, obviously. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, anything else in the chat there, or questions rather? Um, okay. no, no more questions, uh, Peter, I think. Okay. Um, right, yeah. so we can see um, essentially, at the moment, um, at the moment, there's still somewhere to go. But, but in terms of coordination between cities and regions, um, half people think there's a low degree of coordination. Well, it's fairly split, actually, I suppose. Yeah, sorry, but I read it more carefully. Um, so half think there's a low degree of coordination, half think there's a high degree of coordination. And I guess as we talked in the first session, that might be for all sorts of reasons, including political reasons, but where um, the national government and the local authority are from the same political background. Maybe it's easier to get these things aligned than, than where there's a difference. And we can see that in London uh, when the, um, the mayor was of the same party as the national government. And thing, in some ways, things went more smoothly when they're now from opposite parties. So I guess there's, there's lots of elements. There's technical elements, um, economic elements, but also political elements. Um, but I think it's probably fair to say, I mean, I, I, I'm involved in a project called Sun Plus, which has been going for two years now. And when we wrote the proposal three, three and a half years ago, we hardly mentioned carbon. Whereas now in the project, we're spending a lot of time talking about carbon. So I think these change, things have changed a lot in the last couple of years. Um, and therefore, probably some organisations and things are still probably in the process of, um, of adapting to that and so on. So I think one of the features of a transport event is that we should be punctual. So we're just about coming up to three o'clock my time four o'clock most people's time. So I'd just like to, to thank, uh, thank all our speakers um, and to uh, Polis for putting on this event. Um, I hope you found it useful. I found it very useful. Um, the recording will be available afterwards. And if you wanted to get in touch with the individual speakers, then I guess Polis could put you in touch. So thank you all very much indeed for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks a lot, Peter. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. Good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.